then uh, I will introduce, uh, <coughs> we will have a <coughs> major speaker will be Mr. Mehran Baluch, who is a human rights activist uh, on behalf of the Baluch people in, uh, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Iran, and so on. <coughs> Well-known international figure, Mehran Baluch, will speak first about the questions of Pakistan today. And then, uh, secondly, we'll have a, a journalist who's on my right here, who is Mr. Tarek Fatah. He is uh, a journalist with the Toronto Sun newspaper and author of two books, uh, one of them called The Tragic Illusion of an Is Islamic State, and the other book is called Chasing a Mirage. He will speak to us after Mr. Balu. And our final speaker will be <coughs> Mr. Paolo Kasaka, who is executive director of the South Asian Democratic Forum, uh, located in Brussels. He will conclude the speeches, then we will have a good discussion period, and uh, hopefully we'll try to finish by uh, 2, um, actually by 2, two. two thirty. So, as a small introduction, as most of you know, the uh, major problem for the Baluch is the, was the, uh, the ambiguity around the decision in 1947 to establish uh, the two states, uh, Pakistan, <coughs> whether the Baluch should join or not. And uh, this is a continuing problem uh, for them and for Pakistan as well. Uh, I would like to say that there's been a recently a book published, a very important book on the history of Baluch and the Baluchistan by Nasir Dashti. It's been published uh, last year, which gives you a full story of the, uh, from his point of view, of the origin of Baluch, the history of the Baluch, uh, and their arrival into uh, South Asia, and the history of the Khan of Kalat, which was a 300 year long history of a Khanate which was included parts of Afga present day Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan. So uh, the difficulties of the Baluch with the new state of Pakistan have existed since a long time now, and uh, that will be covered by our first speaker, who is uh, Mehran Baluch, and then we shall go further along as I have announced. So, the precarious and dangerous security situation exists in Pakistan today, and it demands the attention of the peace-loving democratic world, because the establishment of this mercenary garrison outpost is the worst human rights violator and exporter of terrorism. Pakistan, by its very inherent nature, never deserved the right to be a member of the Committee of Nations, because it has never been more than a mercenary outpost, and even in the position it is, no longer viable for the prol proliferation of powers centered within. Pakistan is reaping the crop, the seed it sowed in 1947, by promoting religion as a replacement for the old historical and cultural bonds among people. The real howist is yet to come. The strategic assets that it created and merged to achieve the fantasy of strategic depth in Afghanistan and the subjugation of the entire Kashmir, the chickens have come home to roost. The sectarian violence and the war against education progress has amply proved by blowing up schools and killing of health workers on polio eradication programs. The minorities, whether religious or national, are persecuted and harassed by none other than the mafias that hold sway. And when they don't want to dirty their hands, they assign the task to their proxy death squad. Apart from the relig religious Lashkar Jangi and the Jamaatul Dawa and the Haqqani, it has the death squads operating against Baluch nationalists in Balochistan. It has to be understood that Pakistan is not only a threat to the people within its unnatural boundaries, but also to the world's peace and stability. Some naive analysts are in the habit of saying that there is a danger of Pakistani nukes falling into the wrong hands. They do not realize that these are already in the wrong hands. Those wrong hands are the hands of the strategic depth Islamic glory seeking Pakistan army. The best and most effective antidote to the poison being spewed and spread by Pakistan and its rulers is an independent, democratic, secular Baluchistan. Only a strong Baluchistan can counter the threat of spreading scourge of terrorism that emanates from Pakistan. 
the security and peace of the entire region and the world is threatened by Pakistan. The sooner this is realized, the better prospects there are of securing a stable and prosperous region. Although Hazaras are being ethnically cleansed by the Pakistani army, it is its resources and the suppression of the Baluch which is at the forefront. In fact, it promotes the sectarian killers by proliferating madrasas and providing them lands and funds. An independent Baluchistan is the anathema for Pakistan and China as both eye its resource, landmass and coast. It is essential part of their strategic aims because an independent Baluchistan would leave them stranded. The Baluch people are up against vicious enemies, enemies shown decency and morality. For an independent Baluchistan, there has to be concrete efforts from the entire Baluch spectrum of society. All struggles have different aspects, but these have to be a definite unity on the question of independence. An ostrich-like attitude from the Western governments only encourages Pakistani junta to violate human rights of those living there with impunity, to create mayhem in the region with proxy warfare in Afghanistan and Kashmir, to allow terrorists to use its resources and territory for terror-related incidents world over. Closing eyes to this criminal behavior of Pakistani excesses simply makes them complicit in the crime. Pakistan lives in the illusion of past glories created by distortion of history. They have nothing to do with present or future. Their single point agenda is to Islamize the world and the only option open to them is terrorism and the sponsorship of terrorism in All terror-related incidents have been traced back to Pakistan, allowing the prevailing situation to persist in Pakistan. It is an invitation to disaster and turmoil in the region and the world. Without Baluchistan, Pakistan will be unable to survive, and moreover, China will not be able to gain a foothold in the region. My contention is that if we want peace in the region and in the world, then we should support the concept of an independent Baluchistan. I appeal to all the Baluch to unite effectively to challenge Pakistan's evil design. Without unity, the purpose of the Baluch path to freedom would be very difficult. I also appeal to the democratic and the free world that it should understand its obligations towards the nation of Baluchistan and the Baluch. Thank you. That's it. That's very interesting. Now we shall hear from uh, journalist uh, Tarek Sattar. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Specifically, we are supposed to brief you is about the condition of human rights in Pakistan. And uh, unfortunately, the very nature of that state, uh, the very basis of its existence is such that no matter what you do with it, its raison right. that is to quell human rights. Because any, any nation, any society, any country, that is created on the basis of a hatred towards the others will soon run out of people that it can hate or groups that it can decimate and it will devour itself. Uh, I am quite sure you are aware or well thank goodness for the liberal press that none of this is reported. They were so busy reporting about the election of the Pope that nobody mentioned that about a hundred Pakistani Christian homes were destroyed while the cardinals were sitting in their close quarters trying to elect a pope. It seems the lives of ordinary Christians in Pakistan, whether they are Punjabis or Pakistanis or Sindhis or the Baloch, doesn't really matter because in the course of 65 years, these Christians have been decimated to a level where none of them can seek a future other than as sanitation workers. And to destroy an entire neighborhood, without the Western world or the UNHCR or any agency ever raising a finger at this genocide that suggests that it is not just the Baloch people that are uh, being subjugated to uh, tyranny. The Baloch people and Balochistan are an epitome of what this, uh, the state of Pakistan, or what I would suggest is what is left of the state of Pakistan, because Pakistan actually is Bangladesh because it seceded in 1971. So the state of Pakistan actually does not exist. The state that was created due to the uh, 1947 Indian Independence Act, that simply does not exist. And today, this truncated entity run by a rogue a military that cannot fight wars, 
other than kill its own people, is tying up with what I would suggest is the new axis of evil, that is China, Pakistan, and Iran. And the best testimony to this is of what the uh, People's Republic of China and the so-called Communist Party of its rulers has taken over a port built on the coastline of Balochistan, owned historically by the Baloch people, at the mouth of the Straits of Hormuz to ensure that the future oil supply lines from the Persian Gulf are permanently terrorized by three entities, Iran, China, and Pakistan. And this enterprise by Chinese state-run corporations are hell-bent on looting the very resources that a future Balochistan relies on if it has to be built as a new country. Without stopping China from taking over the gold mines in um, uh, uh, the copper mines in Sandak, or the gold mines in Rico Deep, or the port facilities in Gwadar, a Balochistan, even if it wanted to, would not be able to exist because by the time it would come through, the Chinese, as we know what they do in Africa, in Sudan, in Zambia, in Bolivia, everywhere, they have looted and gutted out the very basis of economic enterprise in a colonial effort that very few of us seem to recognize. So China, Pakistan, and Iran, and again, the Chinese, uh, the Iranian pipeline coming from Iran, from its gas fields, straight into Pakistan with the future intention of taking it straight north into China will prove to be a serious threat to the security and well-being of what we refer to as the Western world, which is Europe and North America. If the politicians and the agencies, the intelligentsia and the journalists that inhabit the Western world are blind to what is happening over there and are simply focused on issues that are convenient, then, ladies and gentlemen, as someone who is a student of politics over there, I can assure you, we are <coughs> waiting for a catastrophe to unfold. And what is happening to the Baloch people as they are being decimated by the tens of thousands or the 40,000 who have disappeared and whose bodies are flung out of helicopters near the neighborhoods of their uh, parents. That is going to be the fate of much of the rest of the world because you have to consider an essential question the difference between the fascists of the past and the Islamofascists today is that the fascists of Hitler and Mussolini wanted to take over the world to run it, while Islamofascists want to start life after they have died. De life after death is the fundamental starting point of Islamofascism. And that difference, I don't think, has been understood by those in the West, those scholars or consultants or private firms who run the future of affairs, because we would not be in this mess today if the State Department would not be involved with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, with the jamaat -e islami in Pakistan, and with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Balochistan is the only hope the Western world, or the civilized world, or those who have inherited 400 years of enlightenment and renaissance and reformation Balochistan is your only hope to break apart this evil construct that is linking together those who wish to bring death to human civilization so they can go to a paradise where they promise that life will be eternal. And this may sound quaint to the ears of many observers, but this is the reality of the Islamic terrorists that inhabit in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, and in Pakistan, and are represented at this forum by the Organization of Islamic Countries. So I would conclude by suggesting to you that if there is anyone who thinks that there can be human rights in a reformed Pakistan, they are dreaming in technicolor because the very essence of the existence of the state of Pakistan is to destroy the other. And when all other fails, when everyone else, the Hindus, the Sikhs, the Ahmadiyyas, the Christians, the Shias, the Hazaras, the Baloch are killed, this state will kill itself, and you cannot simply look away because this is the only rogue state that has 200 nuclear arms under its wing. And as uh, Mehran Baloch suggested, it is not that these arms will fall into the wrong hands. The fact is, these arm, nuclear arms are in the wrong hands. A collapse in Pakistan that is unchecked will ensure that the wrong people who have these nuclear arms 
will have the facility to utilize them in tactical warfare. And that is a very dangerous future that I present to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. There's a lot of uh, facts in there all condensed together in good journalistic fashion, but I think every fact that he's brought out can be uh, affirmed quite well. There are many uh, statements about different peoples and so on, but if you look back at the last history of the last four or five years, you'll see that most of what he said is, is, is true. Now, uh, Mr. Paolo Kazaka of the South Asia Democratic Forum in Brussels. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Meran, for uh, the kind uh, invitation and for this opportunity to um, tell you a bit uh, about uh, the reason why South Asia Democratic Forum has been uh, very much concerned uh, with the situation in Balochistan and also to um, tell you what uh, we think it is essential to do in the short term. South Asia Democratic Forum was created um, two years ago. It was uh, precisely the 22nd of March uh, 2011 uh, with uh, the very firm conviction that it is in uh, the core interest of Europe uh, for South Asia to develop in a democratic way. And this from a security, from a, a development, and a, from a sustainability point of view. Only a democratic uh, growing South Asia uh, that is uh, the biggest region in the world, uh, a region, uh, one of the two regions that is growing faster in the world, uh, at least either the, the one or one of those uh, that will determine most of what is going to happen in the, in the world in, in the future, only a democratic, uh, real democratic development can uh, guarantee uh, the interests of the international community and in particular of the European Union. And uh, what uh, we uh, saw in September 11 uh, was um, a symbol, a symbol of uh, the new century of the, the 21st century and uh, was uh, something that uh, um, we uh, thought nobody uh, failed to understand the meaning. Um, it was uh, a fanatic uh, religious Islamist uh, ideology that showed how it could, uh, very symbolically in Washington and in the Twin Towers of New York, how this ideology was looking at the whole world, uh, and therefore that uh, uh, this fiction, that uh, these sort of things could be contained in a certain area or a certain country uh, was shown to be completely uh, bogus, and how threatening this ideology could be. Uh, it was uh, a symbol of a new era of uh, terrorism that is completely different from whatever humanity saw in the past. Terrorism has been a word uh, that has been very uh, often abused uh, and uh, that has been serving as a, as a melting pot for, for a variety of, of things. Just to give you the most uh, obvious example, uh, during the, the Second World War, uh, Nazis always treated whoever resisted them as terrorists. So we have to be careful when we uh, speak about terrorism, because what we saw uh, as the biggest symbol of, of terrorism in September 2011 is something we never saw uh, together in the past, because we have seen uh, some fanatic, um, extreme, uh, violent actions, that is, uh, actions that do not try to get a specific objective, but uh, that want 
to um, uh, bring um, the, the, uh, an extreme answer. Uh, Al Qaeda tried to negotiate nothing. Uh, with uh, nothing specific with the September 11. We just wanted to stop changing the world in their fashion. Secondly, uh, this is a suicidal uh, terrorism, as uh, Mr. Tarek Fatah uh, pointed out uh, very, um, very opportunely. Uh, there is a, an element of suicide, of uh, the death being the future, uh, being an ambition. And sadly, and uh, uh, more important, because we could say the two of the first elements, we had seen them together before in history, but sadly, um, the concept that the most people you kill, never mind children, women, uh, whoever that has nothing to do with it, uh, even regardless of the religion, because as everybody knows, New York is, is the melting pot of uh, religion, of people, of, of whatever. Uh, the more people you kill, the best. Uh, and these three things together, this is something modern. We have not seen that in the past. Uh, and this ideology is an ideology that threatens everyone. Uh, and this is the reason why we are very much concerned with the fact that uh, Islamization and this ideology did not only recede uh, in Pakistan, but actually has been aggravated. Um, when we saw a tragedy like the um, genocide in Bangladesh, which was the biggest genocide after the Second World War, uh, we, uh, we see that basically the ideology and uh, the logic behind um, the Pakistan <coughs> state did not change in over 40 years. Uh, they go to Balochistan exactly with the same sort of attitude. Uh, they think that the way to keep a country together is not to listen to different, uh, to different peoples, is not to uh, allow different languages, is not to respect, no, is to wipe out completely any difference and uh, impose uh, uniformity on a uh, fanatic reading of a religion. And therefore, uh, we saw this, what we can call the slow motion genocide of Balochistan. Slow motion because it goes every day. And uh, every day I um, have uh, the, the unpleasant but the necessary uh, um, surprise of getting a new message of uh, a new body, of uh, an intellectual, of a journalist, of a doctor, of uh, a man of peace whose main crime was to be a leading intellectual figure within a community, the Baluchi community. And his body was just found somewhere uh, within what is, has been called the kill and death policy that actually uh, replicates what was done in 1971 in Bangladesh, but perhaps in a more uh, slow motion. Because in 1971, the very big concern of the Islamists uh, um, genocide was exactly to make disappear whoever could be a uh, representative of an intellectual elite that could show, uh, in this case, the Bengali culture to be something very specific and actually very different from whatever you had uh, in the rest of the country. Uh, and uh, behind this, there is this reasoning, well, if uh, we just destroy every, all the elites, if we kill all the intellectuals, um, the uh, uh, alphabetization in Balochistan is just appalling. It is uh, in one of the countries in the world with the worst the educational indices. Balochistan is the worst of the worst. Um, people, especially women, uh, but people in, in large, 
they do not get any sort of proper education. And so their reasoning is very simple. Well, they are not uh, allowed to learn Balochistan. Uh, if we kill their intellectuals, uh, they will not get the history. They, they, we will just erase the identity, and then we will just make a big injection of uh, um, extreme Islamic doctrine, and then we will have uh, the remaining people will be uh, good uh, Pakistani citizens. Uh, well, this type of, of uh, reasoning is absolutely unacceptable, uh, but that's what we are seeing. And uh, when uh, I see conferences trying to convince the uh, European audiences that there is a democratization process going on uh, in the country, I am really uh, very uh, much surprised because this is no democracy whatsoever. Democracy is not to have formal elections. Democracy is a state of law. Democracy is a respect for the human being, is the respect for the other. And this is exactly what is not there. This is exactly what we do not see appear. So I would like to reaffirm uh, very clearly that uh, we consider the kill and damn policy, the slow genocide in Bangladesh, in, in uh, sorry, in Baluchistan, to be the present, the most important human rights challenge in the whole of the region of South Asia, and we state very clearly to the European authorities that they must make at the stopping of this policy their uh, biggest priority for the, for the region. Because uh, the European Union has been <coughs> developing several trade agreements uh, with Pakistan. And right now, it is considering a new step to give what is called the uh, GSP plus statute to Pakistan. This GSP plus statute whose negotiations are now starting and uh, that uh, will uh, may be attributed from uh, 1st of January 2014 afterwards requires according to the to the regulatory framework of the European Union uh, a various set of obligations uh, several um, uh, compliances with uh, uh, human rights, democratic uh, acts and governance that are obviously not fulfilled and quite on the country. And uh, we think, and uh, we are working on a position paper that we will publish very soon, that uh, this is simply not possible. That for the interests of Europe, for the interests of South Asia, and for the interests most, of course, for the interests of the whole of the country, and most in particular for Pakistan, we think that these conditions have to be put on the table as uh, something that cannot go without, that there cannot be any agreement without their fulfillment. So we think it is not admissible in the list in the present situation to consider such a request to have uh, this statute, which is the most favorable uh, statute for trade within the context of the World Trade Organization. And uh, we invite every organization to uh, read carefully the uh, European regulatory framework because this uh, regulatory framework is, uh, is new, was approved, was enhanced in October 2012. And in one of its articles, it says that um, the uh, associations and civil society organizations are invited to participate in the process and to take position, and this should be done. What we should be doing right now is to demand from Pakistan that the, the laws, uh, the, that all of the regulatory framework that is discriminatory against any minority should be repealed, uh, that the rights 
of the Baluchi Stark people should be recognized and the policy, the kill and dump policy to be stopped immediately in Baluchistan. That the educational policy in Pakistan is not geared to uh, make, uh, to promote hate, but rather on the country to promote understanding. This is the position we are standing for and this is the position that we invite all of you to support in um, in these negotiations. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. So this is uh, an independent